сайн байцгаа нөө Манай захиргааны албаны туршлаг сорилцох семинар тавтай морин нөө Миний нэр Джордж Экономидис өнөөдөр бид шүүхийн учруулагчийн аж холбогдол манай шүүхийн тогтолцоонд ямар үрэгтэй байгааг суралцах болно Нэг дварт би та бүхэнд манай хискийн хүмүүсийг танилцуулъя Колумбия дөргийн шүүхийн шүүгч Judge James Bosberg. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. <laughs> Arizona Gain Targas Shukch, Judge Diane Humitiwa. Asquali, no highlight it, I'm yet so valdi. New York Gain Umnet Turgas, Paula Gold. Muy buenas, me alegro mucho de estar aquí con ustedes hoy. Mane Zahirani Albanas, Javier Soler. Buenas tardes, un placer estar aquí hoy. Энэ хүрэлсэн ирсэн та бүхэн да баярлаа. Hello and welcome to the Court AO Exchange Program's Knowledge Seminar. I am your English speaking moderator, Charlie Hall. I do want to thank uh, George Economides who stood in for me and introduced the program in Mongolian. Imagine for a minute that you're not here in an auditorium or watching uh, online but you're actually sitting in a court of law and you're facing a serious charge that could put you in prison. My question is, would you feel as comfortable not understanding a single word? Today's knowledge seminar explores the important role of court interpreters who, in the words etched atop the U.S. Supreme Court, provide equal justice under law to those who cannot under understand court proceedings in English. To my far right is Judge James Bosberg, a native Washingtonian. He serves on the U.S. District uh, court for the District of Columbia. He previously served as a judge on the D.C. Superior Court and he also is on the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, moving uh, to Judge Bosberg's left, Judge Diane Humitiwa from the District of Arizona is the first woman of Native American descent to serve as a U.S. District Judge. As a border court with numerous Native American tribes, the District of Arizona has many needs for interpreters. Uh, Judge Humitiwa is a member of the Hopi tribe, and she spoke just a few moments ago in Hopi. Uh, Paula Gold oversees the court interpreter program in the Southern District of New York. Uh, we know that the Big Apple is home to more than 8 million people, but it also is home to speakers of nearly 800 languages. Uh, and then representing the administrative office, is Javier Soler. Uh, he's a program manager for the court's interpreting program, and he and his colleagues provide guidance and support to all 94 uh, uh, district courts across the country. So I want to thank our panelists for being here today. So to start us off, we created a brief video to highlight the amazing work done by courtroom interpreters and how the interpreter program got started. This primer will help you follow today's discussion. Let's take a look. In 2018, the U.S. courts reported just over 361,000 interpretation events. This year, the same report shows there will be just as many, or maybe more. The practice of court interpreting came to prominence during the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals. Allied forces recognize the importance of removing language barriers among participants for the sake of legitimacy and transparency. In the U.S., courtroom interpreting gained momentum after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and continued through the 70s. But in practice, the standards of courtroom interpreting were inconsistent. In order to ensure equal protection in criminal trials, President Carter signed the Court Interpreters Act of 1978 into law establishing the right of any individual with a language barrier or hearing or speech impairment to be provided with a competent interpreter. Today, interpretation is a well-established practice. It's a linguistic art that blends law, communication, culture, and technology. Interpreters must meet strict criteria that measures their proficiency in rendering meaning at multiple levels, also known as registers, from street slang to formal legal terms so that participants have a meaningful linguistic presence. Proven and reliable technologies enable remote interpreting via telephone. This ensures that individuals can effectively exercise their right and courts can continue to hold fair and speedy trials when an interpreter is unavailable in a given locality. As the world becomes more interconnected and our inherently diverse nation grows, the need for interpretation will grow with it. 
And although technology can bridge the physical distances, algorithms will likely never fully replicate the nuance of language interpretation. This is ultimately a human act that is vital to the service of justice and the rule of law. Great. I want to thank our video production uh, team for producing this video. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Judge Humitiwa. Uh, can you describe the constitutional issues surrounding the use of interpreters in the courtroom? Certainly. They seem to be very basic. Of course, an individual is deprived of their right to be meaningfully present if they can't understand uh, what is being said by the witnesses in testimony or what is being presented in evidence in any case uh, that they may be involved in. And so in that way, there are Sixth Amendment implications. In addition to that, of course, if you're being aided by a counsel that doesn't speak the same language as you do, and uh, that can also impair your ability to aid in your own defense, as well as to aid your counsel in the defense of you. And so I think, generally speaking, there are uh, 14th Amendment due process implications that certainly arise and, and uh, was there any particular court case that uh, helped define this right? Yes, and in fact, there, uh, there was a case, it was a habeas corpus case out of the Eastern District of New York. It was brought in 1970. It was based out of a conviction. There was a 23-year-old year Puerto Rican man. Of, uh, he had sixth grade education level. And he was convicted after trial of second degree murder and faced a 20 year to life sentence. Well, he brought in pro se his own case, um, alleging that he was deprived of due process. And indeed, when the court went back and looked at what had transpired below, uh, what, it, what indeed occurred was that he, he spoke uh, very lit little English, primarily Spanish. He was aided by a non-Spanish speaking lawyer and during the course of the trial, there were some 14 witnesses that testified, only two of whom testified in the Spanish language using a court interpreter. And in essence, the court only used the interpreter to aid the jury when it was necessary for that translation, to aid the court or defense counsel. And all of this came out in the habeas proceedings. And in fact, the lawyer testified, his counsel testified that he only uh, used a court interpreter during a uh, jail meeting uh, with his client. And so the, the court essentially viewed this as a due process violation. One of the critical pieces of evidence were statements that he made incriminating himself, and he had no way to confront those statements because he had no understanding of what was being said while the testimony was being given. And so he didn't have the ability to confront that evidence or those witnesses. And so um, it was notable in this case that the, the court essentially looking back said, there is no federal precedent or case on point stating that an individual in these circumstances has a right to an interpreter. And in fact, they analyzed uh, additional uh, court cases locally and they found, I found of interest, uh, they basically said in one case there was an individual who spoke French and that individual, however, had the financial means to provide his own interpreter but decided not to do so and in some ways waived that argument. But in any event here they found that uh, the whole process, the entire court proceeding against this individual Negron, uh, violated due process and the Sixth Amendment right. And so it was sh shortly thereafter, as you heard, that the uh, Court Interpreters Act was enacted. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Judge Bosberg, uh, one other phrase that came up in the video was uh, matters initiated by the United States, uh, that that is a requirement for uh, court interpreters. Can you just define what that means? Sure. That means the United States is on the left side of the V, and that <laughs> means in all, any criminal case is brought in federal court, it would be the United States versus the defendant. And so that means in any criminal case brought in any federal court against any defendant, the defendant would be entitled to an interpreter. Okay. And just for a sense of scale, is this something you deal with often in your courtroom where somebody needs an interpreter? Sure. Uh, 
frequently. And again, I think that what the video talked about um, was that it doesn't necessarily need to be someone who can't speak English at all. It's anyone who would feel more comfortable in their native language. And so there are lots of people here in the United States whose first language may not be English. And even though they're quite competent English speakers, they'd still rather have an interpreter at least as reinforcement uh, as they understand the proceedings. Great. Thank you. Uh, Paula, uh, your job in uh, Southern District of New York is in part to find qualified interpreters. Uh, what qualities do you look for and what are the greatest challenges uh, for court interpreters? As supervisory interpreter, um, it's my job to ensure that the best available interpreters are provided to the court. Um, in, when we're looking for Spanish interpreters, the, we only assign certified, federally certified interpreters, so we have that assurance that they meet certain, that they have the requisite skills, and minim, they're minimally competent in order to handle um, court proceedings in, uh, in the courtroom. It's more difficult when um, there are the languages because there is no certifi federal certification program in languages other than Spanish. So if we first reach out to professionally qualified interpreters, um, and there are three levels, I think that Javier was going to explain that a little in more detail, but we know that we have the assurance with a professionally qualified interpreter that they have the requisite skills and the, they have their highly proficient in, in both languages. So, and we hope that they have court experience. If not, we, we help them along with that. Uh, when they're language skilled, and the majority of interpreters that we use um, that are on, in our local, on our local roster and on the national court interpreter database are language skilled. So some of them have years of experience and some of them don't. So we try to find out if they passed any state tests. Uh, we ask them about their experience. We have them come in and observe. We talk to them. And we try to make sure that they're at a level that's suitable to, to work in, in the courts. And it's hard with, with many of the less uh, frequently used languages because they, don't have, they haven't gone the distance like the Russian or the Mandarin interpreters. So we, we, we do have a problem there. So Javier, how does somebody become a courtroom interpreter in the first place? For instance, how did you actually get started? Well, I, I think court interpreting tends to be kind of a second uh, career in life. Uh, most court interpreters um, are, have learned how to straddle both cultures, have learned how to straddle both languages. Um, I became an interpreter while I was in grad school. I was studying as a, to be a translator. And as a translator, uh, I was working with the language only in writing. My, my original career had been as a teacher. I taught Spanish. And while I was in graduate school, I began teaching English. So it kind of morphed into a career that I had not expected. Somebody asked me one time to go and interpret. I naively accepted it without really realizing the, the complexities of it. And, uh, and I began training shortly thereafter to be an interpreter because of uh, my, I, it was something that I found very fulfilling. And, um I'm going to ask, uh, actually, Judge Boesberg, uh, in the cases which have interpreters, uh, how does this affect your, uh, how does this change your job as a judge? Well, you would think that it would change it significantly, but the answer is the interpreters are so good that it doesn't change it very much at all. So what happens in our courtroom is that the interpreter will sit over to the, to the side. So as I'm facing uh, the tables, we have prosecution and defense in front of me, and then the interpreter is over at a desk on the far side of the courtroom with a headphone and microphones, and then the defendant will have headphones on. And so the interpreter, what the interpreter is saying, I, I can't hear, no one else in the courtroom can hear because he or she is simply talking into the microphone so that the defendant can hear. And, and as I said, they're so good at simultaneous interpretation that Aside from the headphones, you almost don't realize they're there. Now, you'll have occasions uh, when I will think, there's no way this per as good an interpreter as she is, she can be interpret interpreting this because the speaker is speaking so fast, and at times I'll encourage speakers to slow down, but I'm doing that for the court reporter anyway. So the answer, the, un the bottom line here is, uh, it really doesn't change my job at all. Okay. Uh, Judge Humitiwa? Uh, 
Well, in our district, as you mentioned, we also have Indian country. And in, in, in some ways, it does make it a little bit more uh, difficult because many of the native languages, such as Navajo, Apache, which are frequently used, um, they can't be simultaneously interpreted. And so we have to often wait for full sentences or phrases to be completed. And then it takes a little bit more uh, time and patience. But otherwise, it is usually the same situation in terms of the simultaneous interpretation. But it certainly can um, slow the process just a bit. But I think it also helps the process. How so, if I may ask, in that last point? In terms of having all the parties understand what the circumstances are and that the defendant is fully aware uh, of what it is that is being said, what is being alleged against them, and then having their uh, own uh, statement be fully interpreted in a manner that he or she agrees with, I think gives everybody the full picture of what we have to uh, concern ourselves with there. Okay. So uh, last question in this segment, uh, Paula and Javier, I'm hoping you can actually just put us in the shoes of what it's like to be a courtroom interpreter since you've both played this role. Um, first time you were in a courtroom, what was that actually like, e either one of you? It was terrifying. <laughs> it was, we have people speaking quickly and it was, at that time we didn't always use equipment. It was a little hard to hear. Um, it, it was, I felt that every day was a test to see if I could, um, you know, finish standing on my feet without being mentally saturated. Um, but it was something that I was attracted to from the very beginning. I had always done informal interpretation. I lived in Spain for many years and interpreted uh, for people between Spanish and English. And I just felt this is this is right for me. Um, but it's tough, you know. It, there's a lot of stress involved, and you, it takes a while until you can kind of your nerves dissolve. Uh, Javier? I think she defined it the same way I would have. It was nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. uh, you go in there, you are on display, and it's very difficult to learn how to kind of meld into the background and disappear so that uh, judges have an experience like Judge Boasberg described, which is they're not even there. Um, it's, it's actually very gratifying, Judge, to hear that. That means that, that we're doing somewhere out there, we're doing the right thing. Uh, but it, it's, um, the interpreter will feel uh, everything that's going in that, on, in that courtroom. Well, it, it, they're conduit not only for language, they're conduit for, for culture, but they're also a conduit for all the emotion that's going in there. And, and it can be very exhausting, both emotionally as well as physically. And, and in the early days especially, do you feel any pressure, like, what if I get this wrong? Oh, absolutely. I think even to this day uh, yes. in court, that's always a pressure. It's, it's still a test oh, every absolutely. day, and you, won't, you don't want to fall on your face. <laughs> I, I think if an interpreter ever forgets the importance of what's going on in that courtroom, that interpreter should probably consider moving on somewhere else. It's, it's, it's an everyday, it, it may be old hat to us, but it's for the people that are, whose lives are at stake, it's a very real thing, and it's a very present thing. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to uh, do a brief instructional video. Many interpreting uh, program activities are managed locally by the courts, much as uh, Paula does in the Southern District of New York. However, the AO also plays a critical role, and our next video is going to explain that relationship. The Court Interpreters Act has perhaps two prongs. It requires the courts to use interpreters in matters initiated by the United States. And it empowers the AO to identify and certify for the court's selection individuals that are capable of providing that interpretation. The AO administers a national court interpreters database that comprises about 3,000 interpreters of a few hundred languages, including a thousand interpreters of Spanish that we have certified over the years. The AO came up with three categories of interpreters. The first category is the federally certified interpreter, but that's only for Spanish. Then we have for the other languages that are not certified languages, professionally qualified. Then we have the language skilled interpreters. The AO's role with respect to certification of interpreters is to actually 
develop and administer examinations that certify interpreters of languages that are commonly needed in United States courts. Certification is based on what they call a criterion reference exam, which is what nowadays is the Federal Court Interpreting Certification Exam. Periodically, the AO will conduct a training workshop. We've been trying to do that every other year, where we bring courts together, the individuals that actually secure the services of interpreters for each court. My favorite thing about coming to conferences like this is, with, is just networking with the people. And so it's a great, great way to share ideas. I wish there was an easier way to do that. Maybe there are some options that you guys can give me as to how to find somebody on short notice. Courts call us for everything from procurement all the way to helping them find languages in extreme emergencies. Uh, by finding languages, I mean interpreters in those particular languages. My colleagues and I spend many hours each week talking to coordinators of court interpreters in each of the federal courts, helping them with whatever they need. I think I have the answer that you needed. We are seeing an increasing rise in the demand for interpreters in languages of lesser diffusion. It's a very broad term and it changes from region to region because maybe in California, Mandarin may not be lesser diffusion, but if you go to Nebraska, it could be. So each court is dealing with its own set of needs. We also have the telephone interpreting program, which allows the courts to bring an interpreter from another court virtually over the phone lines to appear in their court. We are so proud of it because of the access that it provides. The proudest moment of an interpreter is when they're told, hey, I forgot you were there, because an interpreter should be invisible. It will always demand for a court to be vigilant for judges to be aware of the dynamics in front of him or her and to manage the situation as appropriate. The person has to be present, not just in body, but in mind, and help with his defense. It's absolutely a constitutional issue without being present in the courtroom and without being there, being able to hear the charges and understand what it is that you're charged with and, and what the, is happening during the process, you're just not present. I'd like to uh, focus on one key challenge. We, as was mentioned earlier, there's 800 languages in New York alone. So clearly there's a challenge in uh, uh, finding qualified interpreters. Javier, can you expand on some of the tools that were talked about in this video, things like the database and the really walk through the three tiers of qualification? Sure. Um, the National Court Interpreter Database, also known as the NCID, is uh, probably one of the primary tools that many courts use to find interpreters. What it is, is it's a, it's a centrally kept database. It's got over 3,000 uh, interpreters in it. We, we're not able to cover 800 languages, but there are, there are several hundred languages in there. And um, it includes interpreters of three categories, uh, what we deem as AO certified. And those are languages in Spanish at this time, but we still have some Haitian, Creole, and Navajo interpreters that are in that database and uh, professionally qualified as well as language skilled. Now, that's not a commentary on a person's skills level, skill level. What it is is professionally qualified recognizes two or three different certifications that are out there from other government agencies that uh, kind of give us the assurance that they have the skill sets necessary to go in into the courtroom. The language skilled interpreters may not fall under that category, but may be highly skilled as well. So that, at that level of category, usually the courts will make certain that the person has the skills not just in writing, but also the skills, uh, the, the actual skills in practice. Um, it's, it's a very useful tool. It's not the one tool available. We have other tools that are uh, probably going to be discussed um, during this next hour, but, um, but they're, it's probably the primary tool and a very important one. Okay. Paula, first off, do you use the database often? And I do use okay. it often. We, for certain languages, we have a very strong and solid um, local roster. Um, but for many languages, and recently we've been getting many languages from Africa, from Asia, that we haven't seen in years or we've never seen. So we, the first thing we do is go to the database. 
we don't we are not always successful and people are not available or they just don't exist in that language so we have to look elsewhere can I ask you to give an example as the languages get less common can you give us a few examples of what you have to go through sure um, we have well there are many there's a, there's a, a language called Tamil which is spoken in Sri Lanka and in some parts of India um, and we couldn't find anyone at all. And we searched and we, we researched and we, we finally found someone. This person, I think, was known to another interpreter. And we got her on board. She lives 80 miles away from the courthouse and she uh, has a full-time job. So it's, everything has to be arranged around the interpreter. So it's difficult. If we ever had a trial in that language, then we'd be in trouble and we'd have to uh, Find, find the uh, solution elsewhere. But um, we have several languages that we had a, we needed Hausa from Ghana, and there just were no Hausa interpreters. We finally looked to a community group in the Bronx where um, many of the people from Ghana live, and I found a radio announcer who was available, and he turned out great. So we have to be very creative in the way that we recruit interpreters. Uh, Judge Shumiti, well, one of the things I found interesting is you talked about, I, I believe, 19 uh, Native American tribes in your district in Arizona. Uh, what kind of interpreting needs do they have? Oh, well, almost on a every other week basis, because we have uh, what we call Major Crimes Act jurisdiction, essentially the government can bring uh, serious violent crime charges uh, on individuals who commit crimes in Indian country. So um, because in this day and age, and for uh, about 20 years now, many tribal members are now born, raised, educated on their local community. Many of them have um, begun to reinvigorate the language. And so you have um, really healthy languages now in native populations. In addition to that, in the much older populations, and I say older, meaning uh, 45 on up, generally you do have individuals who are undereducated and who may only primarily speak um, native languages. And so we have the need for, for example, Navajo interpreters very frequently, White Mountain Apache, uh, other Apache languages, down south, the Tohono O'odham, or, or uh, the, those that are abut the uh, Mexican-American border. There's a tribe there. And um, it is sometimes very difficult because I only know of one Navajo interpreter that we use, one White Mountain Apache interpreter. And when they're unavailable, we do have to uh, really be flexible with their schedules. They're also called upon to uh, provide interpretive services for you know, other government entities as well. And I've had uh, to use them with uh, competency evaluation uh, processes. So I basically order the Federal Bureau of Prisons during their competency restoration pros process to utilize a uh, native speaking interpreter. And they have to do that uh, by way of telephone and find other means to be able to facilitate that. So it, is, it can be a challenge. So Charlie, uh, Judge Mitra obviously is a much more interesting docket than, than most of us <laughs> and a more varied docket. The only interpreters I frequently need are for bureaucraties, and uh, even, <laughs> I haven't found one of those yet, so Paul and Javier. We, we all need that particular interpreting assistance, actually. But the, uh, uh, I did want to ask you one thing, Judge Bosberg. Uh, when you have an interpreting case, it falls on the judge, I assume, to make sure that the process is happening correctly and, and people's rights are being honored. In practical terms, how does a judge go about doing that? Well, that's a very hard question, and, and the answer is I essentially am relying on the excellency and competence that, that the people that Javier and Paul are bringing forward are engaging in because I have no idea, quite frankly, if someone is correctly interpreting the language if it's a language I don't speak. And aside from a little restaurant French, that, that covers a lot of languages. Uh, now, occasionally you'll have a litigant whose counsel will be fluent in the language being interpreted, and they might come to the bench and say, wait a minute, I don't think the interpreter is interpreted, interpreted that phrase correctly. 
Now, that's very rare. Uh, but again, that's a tough one to referee because who am I to say, yes, they did interpret it correctly, no, they didn't. And typically what I'll do is I'll have the lawyer and the interpreter see if they can find some agreement and then we'll proceed from there. But again, I think these folks are so good that that's a very rare occurrence. So one question I'd like to uh, throw out to the entire panel. Uh, uh, do the issues of court interpreting ever go beyond just language? Do you ever get situations where there's a, a basic idea or concept that's actually very hard to translate? Um, Javier, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the interpreter not, doesn't just translate language. The interpreter will translate the concepts and try to translate what we call meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important to understand that not only are they the voice of the, of the defendant, they're the ears of the defendant, they're a cultural conduit, and all that needs to be preserved. Uh, the idea is not to just interpret word for word, and, and that's a very important point. Um, in fact, a lot of mistakes can be introduced by doing that. So, uh, so the interpreter must be ever vigilant, uh, making certain that, that they're trying to convey all those meanings to kind of remove the language barrier so that everybody else can get about their business in the courtroom. Uh, Judge Shemiti, a similar question, particularly in the Native American context. Are there ideas that are actually hard to communicate? Well, I came into um, an experience just a few months ago. Uh, I talked about competency proceedings. I had a competency hearing where an individual uh, had been restored to competency, and there was a dispute about that. And so he was on the witness stand, and there was a Native American interpreter aiding him and his counsel asked the question what does it mean to testify and I waited for the interpretation and during the course of the interpretation the interpreter used the term testify so before the individual could answer I pointed that out to him and I said so why how do you uh, translate testify into the language and he said well judge if I do that I'll be giving him the answer and so that, for me, caused some pause. And then later on in that same hearing, um, I did ask a couple of the individual experts who had evaluated the individual or performed certain tests whether or not the tests were administered in the nat native language. And they said no, because there was no means to do so. And then it got further on down uh, in their testimony that in fact, many of the evaluation tools that are being used in our uh, systems are not able to be scored using native, certain native languages, and e even in some cases, the Spanish language. So that has me a little bit uh, you know, puzzled and a little bit worried about you know, then how much um, weight to give some of these uh, examination findings. And so I think there, there are some some issues that can arise and do arise. Uh, Paula, anything you would add to this particular question? Uh, the interpreter has to have some cultural awareness and um, there are things that are difficult for for many defendants or litigants to understand, if, especially if a certain concept doesn't exist in their in their language. Um, I always uh, refer to um, humor, idiomatic expressions, um, Irony, uh, which is very common, certainly in the New York courtroom. Um, you, there, there's a lot of wit and irony. Um, and things just go right above not only the defendant's head, but sometimes right above the interpreter's head. If someone has acquired English and hasn't been raised here, there are a lot of um, base, there's a lot of colloquial language and, and jokes that they just don't get. So that's, that's a problem. So, and as far as being, um, uh, aware, for example, this is uh, in English. Attorneys very often say to their clients, "You're stupid. You're not. You're not accepting this plea." And even though it, it's not, it's it's a pretty equivalent. It's it's stupid is estupido, but it it carries a lot more weight in Spanish. So you would say, "This is stupidity that you're not." You know, you take the you take it away from the defendant and you put it in. Uh, more of an abstract uh, realm. Um, you just because otherwise the defendant will, will become really offended, and I've seen that happen. With, um, so you just have to be aware of these subtleties. And, uh
Yeah. When you interpret. So, um, Javier, uh, you, you've talked about the difference between translation and, and interpreting, but at the same time, it sounds like it's the interpreter's role to be very faithful to what's actually being said in a courtroom. Have you ever been caught in a situation where something is said that puts you in an awkward position as a translator or as an interpreter? Well, yeah, I can think of one situation or more than one, but that is a very commonplace thing for interpreters. Interpreters have to maintain what we call the register which means the level of language. So if you're speaking at a very formal level, you maintain that. But that also goes to the other extreme, which is the extreme where you may have profanity, where you may have racial slurs thrown at somebody. Uh, and, and to give you a situation, I was in a courtroom one time where the defendant was rather upset with the judge because of, um, of the verdict that they had had, the sentencing. And, uh, and the person decided to throw a bunch of slurs and a lot of profanity at the judge. And, of course, everybody was looking at me, thinking that I was the one that was yelling these things <laughs> at the judge. So uh, I made a little gesture to make sure that the, marshal, the U.S. Marshal knew that it wasn't I who was doing that. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, it, the registry must be maintained, and that also includes, at times, very uncomfortable language. So... Uh... I would like it if each of you, uh, and uh, I think we'll start with the judges, could each of you share one story where there was a particular challenge in finding an interpreter or helping them do their job? Judge Bosberg? I remember, actually, I was, this was when I was a prosecutor in Superior Court, and there was a homicide case where uh, at Gallaudet University, which is the premier university for the deaf and hard of hearing here in Washington, and the defendant was a student, and he had killed over several months two other students at the school, and he was on trial for murder, and I was prosecuting him. And what was incredibly complicated was that we had a, a deaf defendant, deaf witnesses, and many deaf spectators because they were students or other people in the Gallaudet community. And so we had to have teams of interpreters. One was interpreting for the defendant at all times. Another was interpreting for the witness. And then we would bring in a big screen and we would have a camera trained on one of the interpreters and we'd have the screen shown to the spectators so the spectators could follow along. And so it was fascinating how this group all worked together on an exhausting trial. But one interesting other piece of it was that I remember, so, and this was all done in American Sign Language, um, in ASL. And I remember at one point that I was questioning the defendant and, and cross-examining him about what I thought was sort of a ridiculous uh, account he was giving. And I was asking questions in a sarcastic tone that the jury, of course, could hear. But they were being, it was being interp interpreted straight because ASL was interpreting the words that I was saying. And there were objections by the defense saying, Look, because he, would look, he was looking silly answering questions that I meant sarcastically as if I'd meant them just straight on. And, and it was a complicated scenario for the interpreters who I think were caught in the middle because they, they weren't able to appropriately explain inflection and tone they, as opposed to just the words that were being used. So I think that was, it was, a, it was quite, quite a saga in that case. Uh, Jesu Yes, I've had several instances in my own court where we've had to delay proceedings because we couldn't locate a particular um, uh, interpreter. Uh, I, I recall one from Guatemala. There was an individual on a reentry violation in from that area, and uh, I think we eventually reverted to a tip line where we had somebody from, I think, one of the registries that had to come in uh, through the airwaves. They, they're not present in the courtroom, and and that takes some getting used to in terms of the process. But we also had, I know in our sister court down in Tucson, there was uh, an instance where um, the interpreter's office couldn't locate a MAM interpreter. And it is a dialect from, I, I believe, in, deep in South America. And there are uh, versions of the dialect that is spoken there. And so the the parties couldn't get past the preliminary hearing stage because of the need for an interpreter or to find an interpreter, so they kept continuing it. And finally, this came uh, by way of a motion to dismiss uh, the charges, and the court uh, did dismiss the charges eventually because uh, there was an outline of all the attempts made to find individuals to uh, render that interpretation. And indeed, there was one individual who came in, but the dialect was different. And it was different enough so that it wasn't understandable by the defendant. So 
uh, that case went away. And uh, so there have been several instances where I've, we've run in, at least in the courts in Arizona, run into that uh, difficult circumstance. Uh, Paula. We've had several uh, occasions when we've had to find interpreters for, for languages that had no interpreters. Um, the one case in 2014, I believe it was, um, there were six people arrested um, in, I think they were arrested in, in Ghana, but they were from Guinea-Bissau, which is a, um, and, they, and they spoke a Portuguese-based uh, Creole. Uh, there just were no, there were people that, that could interpret from Portuguese to the Creole and, and vice versa, but there, but there just were no, nobody that um, could do English in, in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, one of the defendants did speak enough Portuguese, which was the official language of the country. Um, the others spoke, again, uh, spoke uh, the uh, Creole, and there was one, in fact, who's, who was not very proficient in Portuguese or Creole because he spoke his tribal language, which was Balanta. So that really caused a problem, and that was impossible to, to resolve. So because uh, the interpreter that we found and, and gave a lot of orientation uh, spent many, many hours um, helping him improve his skills and giving him material, he, had, he developed a good relationship working with this particular defendant, so um, he accepted. He said he understood enough in Portuguese and, and Creole. But um, it was a very difficult case. You know, the interpreters really, they were motivated, but they never really reached a very proficient level, so the judge was very kind and generous in, in making sure that everybody spoke slowly. And, uh, but we did it. <laughs> uh, Javier? Now, the one case that comes to mind was back when we were not very aware, mm -hmm. probably about 15, maybe even longer than that, 15, 20 years ago. This was a young lady who had come from the Oaxaca area in Mexico. Uh, they speak uh, a, a language called Mixteco. And uh, so we had an idea, we had a general idea where she came from. Uh, she was accused of a horrific crime. She had murdered her newborn child. So this matter was not going to be going away. Um, and, and we began with some of the assumptions that we would all begin culturally, and that is show her a map and ask her where she's from. Well, she was illiterate. And not only was she illiterate, she had never seen a map. So to her, the map meant absolutely nothing. She had no idea she was Mexican. She knows she was Mexican, but she didn't know that she was Mexican. So as we began working at trying to find an interpreter, by the time we got to the third interpreter, we were able to find an interpreter that was able to communicate at a reasonable enough level that they could sit down, read the map out loud until she showed a glimmer of recognition for towns, and we began zeroing in on an interpreter until we finally found somebody who was, uh, who was uh, good enough to be able to help her out and to interpret for the court. Uh, there was a lot of activity going on every time we got a little closer, but, but that was the end result. So it was a, a very challenging thing. We, we all assumed that everybody can read, that everybody will see an image and understand what the image means. But the, even that can be a challenge sometimes in the courtroom. And however, I want to follow up on a very interesting conversation we had this morning. When all else fails and you have no idea where to even get started to find somebody who speaks a, 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 an uncommon language. You said there's one avenue you've pursued successfully a few times. One of the ways that I have discovered is a, it's a pretty good way of finding an interpreter is in most South American and, and, and really in most places, um, there has been a group of Christians that have traveled to that area. And if Christianity has gotten, gone to that area, there's generally a translation to the Bible. And when that happens, what we've done is we've gone to find out who worked in that team. We've run into situations where this was done 50 years ago and that's no good at that time. But we've gone to that team and typically we're able to find a university professor who worked with somebody in that community and then go about the complicated process of giving them the proper orientation and hopefully trying to help them head towards a good proficient interpreting. Great thing. So the last question I'd like to ask in this section is for you, Paula. Uh, this has to do with once you finally found somebody, they're in the courtroom. Uh, what are the conditions? What are the biggest stressors? You, you talked about how it can be exhausting. It's stressful. What are the biggest condition, courtroom condition issues, and what can be done to alleviate those? 
um, simultaneous interpreting and consecutive interpreting can be very stressful. Your mind, uh, over a certain period of time, your mind becomes saturated, um, your processing is affected, and when that happens, um, you can't ensure accuracy. So um, we always encourage, if there's a lengthy proceeding, we always encourage um, that team interpreting. That would be two interpreters um, that work together. Uh, one of them, and they rotate, because studies have shown that after 30 minutes of um, intense uh, concentration, um, your, uh, your attention wanes, and, and interpreters, without even realizing, it start, start to make little mistakes. So if we have two interpreters on a, any proceeding that lasts an hour or longer, we can avoid that and ensure accuracy by having one interpreter there or watching if there's a problem with vocabulary that they, she can write a, a note to the, to the team member. Um, it just, we can look up words for the other, you know, we can, it's a collaborative effort and you don't end up with that mental and physical fatigue that, that comes with interpreting over lengthy periods of time. Uh, so we have the biggest problem in, in the courtroom is speed. Um, the judge had mentioned when the discourse is excessively rapid, it presents a tremendous challenge for the interpreter. Um, I spoke to some court reporters in the Southern District last week to ask them because they clock their time. The machine tells them how, how many strokes. And, and in the Southern District of New York, um, there are judges that speak over 300 words per minute which is very, very quick. And it's very difficult for the, even 250 words a minute is difficult. It's difficult for the court reporter, but it's even more difficult for the interpreter who has to understand what he or she is, is hearing, analyze it, and then convert it to another language. So with team interpreting, if, if there's very dense arguments, if, if when your mind is spent, you know, you just pass the mic over to a colleague and that, and that helps. Another challenge in the courtroom is audibility. If we can't hear, we can't interpret. And um, equipment helps, but we always stress that the courtroom be well equipped with microphones um, so that we can hear and manage the, uh, the discourse. Uh, the question I'd like to ask the panel is we've covered a lot of ground and starting with Javier, uh, what's one idea you hope that each audience member takes away with them as it relates to courtroom interpreting? I think the most important message to, uh, regarding court interpreters is that court interpreters are not there to make people understand or to make it possible for people to understand what's happening in the courtroom. And I, and I know that sounds kind of contradictory to what we've said. What the interpreter there is there for is to remove the language barrier. Once the language barrier is removed, the court can go about its business, the attorneys can go about their business, and they're able to help that defendant understand. So what the interpreter is, is a conduit towards, underst towards understanding and towards uh, uh, just simply removing the one barrier that keeps them from being truly part of the process. Okay, thank you. Paula? I, I think that the most important uh, thing that I'd like to uh, emphasize is, is are the working conditions that you know we all strive to 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 do our best to interpret accurately and completely and um, and abide by the the ethical um, standards that that court interpreters must uh, comply with. But if the speech is too fast it causes um, a great burden on the interpreter if we can't hear properly, if team interpreting is not used. Um, all of these things really are important and that especially in cases where we have interpreters who are not native English speakers and who do struggle to understand the proceeding, to just keep that in mind. Judge okay. Mitiwa? Yes, I think uh, following along those lines, it really is a basic understanding of uh, well, I, I guess a basic appreciation that every person has the uh, right to be meaningfully participatory in the case that's being brought against them. And certainly if they don't have a basic understanding of what's being said by another party or by the court or by their lawyer, then there is virtually no participation. And so um, I think that's a basic idea that I have. <laughs> 
Judge Wilson. Again, the best referees in, in a football or basketball game are ones who you don't know are there because they're so professional and so good they let the game just play. And I think that, that what people sometimes fail to appreciate is to achieve that in interpretation, how good interpreters must be, how fast they must be, how strong their stamina must be, and how able they must be to follow each nuance of what's being said by witnesses and by the defendant. And in order to have a seamless court proceeding, and, and having heard all of this today, I, I, I remain more and more impressed with how good so many of them are. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. Uh, we're going to now take some questions from the audience, and we'll start with uh, Henry. Hi. Um, I have a question for Judge Humitawa. But I was curious about uh, something you said earlier in the, in the program when you said that Apache and Navajo could not be translated simultaneously. Uh, and I was wondering whether you would include Hopi in that group, and also what is the reason for that? You know, there are, there are some phrases in Hopi that really you need to complete the entire idea, and then it can be translated into English. Um, and I think, um, I don't really know what the, the origin is, that I just think there's not a match for match in terms of the English word or there's a vari variation on that word. And uh, I'll give you another example. I, I remember as a, um, as a for I was a former prosecutor in my uh, early years, and I remember when uh, we had a case or several cases off of the Navajo Nation, um, the interpreter would use the word Washington, and he would use that word every time someone referred to the government's lawyer. And so the phrasing developed uh, in terms of government or federal government to use Washington, Washington. So I think it's just some of the evolution of language uh, that you know, also can, can uh, uh, rear its head in some of these native languages. Thank you. Uh, Laura? Good afternoon. We have several questions that have come in from the courts. The first question is from the United States District Court, Middle District of Florida. If an objection is made while the interpreter is interpreting for the witness at the witness stand, is it mandatory that the argument over the objection be interpreted for the witness? If the witness is the defendant, then it, it is mandatory. Um, if it's, we don't necessarily interpret for the, for a witness, a colloquy between the judge and the, um, and the parties. And, and, and I typically do. I simply, uh, we use interpreters <laughs> similar to what I'm, uh, interpreter equipment similar to what I'm wearing now. And I might do a whispered interpretation where I know the defendant is hearing because the defendant is wearing headphones, yeah. headphones, and then the witness might be hearing the same thing. So really, the interpretation is being done more for the, the defendant. defendant. And then if you have the added bonus of the, the witness and the witness stand hearing, then that's a good thing too. Okay. The next question comes from the Eastern District of Virginia. Does the Court Interpreters Act require the provision of an interpreter in a civil action filed by the United States? Well, that, that's kind of an interesting question because, um, because of the language of the, interpreter, the in, uh, Court Interpreters Act, um, there is the presumption that it applies primarily in criminal proceedings. But if there, I think if there were uh, a proceeding that was brought uh, by the government in a civil action, and that individual, uh, and, I, and I should add the caveat that really it is the presiding judicial officer who has the duty and the discretion to determine, number one, whether the individual uh, is a primary uh, non-English speaker or is hearing impaired, and then that judicial officer then will make the determination whether or not it is helpful to the proceedings to have that interpreter. So I, th I think uh, there can be those cases where, it, and I remember another uh, set of cases that would also require the use of interpreters, and that would be in, in uh, 2255 or habeas 
uh, proceedings uh, or someone's uh, challenging a jury verdict or so on. Um, so I think there are some caveats. I do know that there are some court cases that have said that the Court Interpreters Act does not establish a new constitutional right, but it does uh, create an obligation on the courts to facilitate the use of an interpreter where necessary. And, and if I may add to that, what the one part where we do always provide interpreting services, whether it is uh, a civil matter or in other words a matter in, uh, or a matter instituted by the United States or a criminal matter uh, is for American Sign Language any, or any kind of accommodation for the deaf and, and hard of hearing which may be any combination of, of different services so we do in that case always provide interpreting services. Okay thank you we have one more question this question is from the Eastern District of New York are there any specialized tools or techniques used to used by interpreters to facilitate services and ensure accuracy? In the Southern District of New York and in I think the majority of large districts in, in any event, um, we use infrared uh, equipment, uh, transmitters and receivers so that we can move over to the side with a microphone and interpret everything for the defendant. It's much more beneficial and it's much less stressful for the interpreter. It's easier for team interpreting when somebody has to take over the mic. Um, it's much smoother than having somebody move the chair, stand up and sit down. Um, there are many. It also it, it discourages the defendant from speaking to the interpreter, which um, often happens. They have someone they think is an ally sitting next to them and no matter how many times you say, I can't answer that. So, it just, there are so many advantages to, to using equipment um, that uh, we, it's the policy in our courthouse, even though interpreters sometimes say, in my language, I have to, and we tell them, no, in this courthouse, we use equipment. I'd like to thank you, the panelists from, from the courts. Thank you. Last call. I'm actually going to ask one last question. I guess I'm a member of the audience here, too. Um, we've talked a lot about courtroom interpreting today, but I'm interested in what happens immediately after the arrest. Do, is there an obligation to give the Miranda rights in a native language? And when a defense lawyer is appointed, how do they handle interpreting needs? So, so I think that, in, in actually, in my deaf murder suspect case, there was controversy. The, the, the police were very sure before they questioned him not to bring in any interpreter, but to bring in a qualified sign language interpreter. And that was still the subject of a motions hearing where the defendant moved to suppress the, his confession on the ground that there wasn't a qualified court interpreter. Now, it turned out in Washington, D.C., this is a local case, not a federal case. But there was no such thing uh, anywhere. There were, there were no, the statute didn't had run out or there were no specific qualified interpreters, but the court ultimately found that the, that the people who interpreted who were federally qualified were sufficiently qualified under the D.C. statute also. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are um, defense, defense lawyers. Uh, how is that handled? Uh, After an arrest, um, in our courthouse, we <coughs> assist the defense attorneys in, in communicating with uh, their client and, as well as the pretrial services Great. agency. Super. Thank you. Well, in that case, uh, we are out of time and I am actually out of questions. So uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience and I especially want to uh, thank our uh, panel today, uh, uh, beginning with people who uh, spoke, uh, AO Director Jim Duff. Uh, I want to thank uh, George Economides of the uh, AO who first learned Mongolian as a Peace Corps volunteer and started the program off. And then our panel. Judge James Bosberg of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, Judge Diane Humitiwa of the District of Arizona, Paula Gold of the Southern District of New York, and Javier Soler. Uh, and I'd finally like to thank the organizers of the Court AO Exchange Programs, Laura Simon and Thad City Drake for making this possible. So thank you again, panel, for giving a wonderful program today.